Hello again, and welcome to more chemistry. I'm Dave Hicks, and today we're going to talk about intermolecular attractions. At the end of today, I expect that you should be able to represent intermolecular attractions in solutions. Actually show the particles and how they interact with each other. Identify polar and nonpolar molecules by looking at what the, what the particle is made out of. And finally, predict which substance are going to dissolve and which ones will not. It all starts with electronegativity. Electronegativity is an attraction that an atom has for electrons in a bond. Now, not every atom pulls on electrons with the same amount of force. Some pull on it with a lot of force, and others pull on it weakly without much force at all. And uh, let's take, for instance, metals. Metals tend to hold on to their electrons very, very weak. And uh, it's because of this that metals have all of their very unusual and unique properties, like the ability to conduct electricity, or its shininess, or the malleability that it has. All of this is because electrons have a loose hold on the, I'm sorry, that metals have a loose hold on their electrons and allow the atoms to shift and move about and allow it to interact with light and allow the electrons to move from place to place freely. This is what's responsible for its really cool properties. Well, you have something like sodium here that's holding very loosely onto that electron, and it can meet up with something like chlorine that pulls on electrons with an enormous amount of force. And when this happens, it's like having a pit bull meet up with a chihuahua, you know, and they're going to fight over the bone. Who's going to get that bone? I'm telling you, it's going to be the pit bull, isn't it? And it's going to completely take away that electron from the other atom. When this happens, and uh, the one loses the electron, if you remember right, then uh, it becomes positively charged, right? So you have this sodium over here that gets its positive charge. And over here on this side, you get the chlorine has an extra electron, so it turns into a negative charge. And that's what holds ionic substances together, the positive and negative charges. They each have their own octet of electrons now. There is no real bond between them. It's just electrostatic pulling towards each other because one side's positive, the other side's negative. Let's go to the other extreme now with diatomic molecules. That would be a molecule that is made out of two of the same types of atoms. So which of these is going to pull more strongly on the electrons? Neither one. They're going to form a covalent bond. Remember covalent bonds where they share electrons inside of its merged or common orbital that it has between them. So in between here is the orbital where the electrons are at. It takes the orbital from the, this chlorine, the orbital from that chlorine, blends them together into one. And in here, it has two electrons. Now, for these two electrons, neither atom is really pulling on it any more strongly than the other one is. So the electrons don't go to one side or the other. It doesn't get taken away by this chlorine or that chlorine. Each of them experiences a force that's equal to the other one. This would not have any positives or negative ends of it because all of the charges are distributed equally in that bond. So let's kind of split the difference now. We've looked at one that completely steals the electrons away because one's holding on to the electrons very tightly, the other one very loosely. We've looked at it where the two are holding on to it with equal strength. What happens when one pulls on the electrons with just a little more force than the other one. That results in what we call a polar bond. A polar bond is when two atoms are still sharing the electrons, still have a merged orbital between them. However, one of the atoms is pulling the electrons a little bit closer to itself than the other atom is. Now, if you remember electronegativity, 
it increases as we go this way on the periodic table and it also increases as we go up on the periodic table so over here in this corner is where the very strong pulling takes place see there's chlorine some of the ones that pull with a lot of strength the most strength on everything on this chart are nitrogen oxygen and fluorine they are very small atoms and they also have a lot of electronegativity their nucleus has a very strong pull on electrons metals are over here as you can see and they have very weak pull on electrons so let's take a look at this I have oxygen and hydrogen together oxygens over here one of the very strong force having a very strong force on electrons hydrogen over here not so much it's a small atom so it has a a little bit of electronegativity to it more than its uh, other metals that are around it that's what makes it so it's not necessarily a metal even though it's on this side of the chart and then uh, when we put hydrogen and oxygen together oxygen and hydrogen will have a shared orbital between them where it's going to contain this however the oxygen is gonna have the electrons closer to itself than the hydrogen is so even though the hydrogen and oxygen are sharing the electrons the oxygen is gonna get the primary benefit of the electrons here because it has a stronger pull on those electrons well hydrogen over here on this side is sort of missing its electrons they're over here but they're not close to it and it's not getting the benefits of it you know what happens when you're missing electrons or electrons have moved away from you a little bit you get a positive charge so this side of this bond takes on a little bit of a positive charge not like an ion but just a little bit of a positive charge over here on this side oxygen has some extra electrons you know what happens when you have extra electrons you get a bit of a negative charge so this side of this bond has a little bit of a negative charge positive charge negative charge separated from each other that's what we refer to as a polar bond polar means it has two ends to it a positive end and a negative end kind of like a magnet we say a magnet is has poles right and that's because it has a positive end and a negative end a north pole and a south pole and just like a magnet this bond the negative side of this bond will be attracted to positive ends of other polar bonds and this positive end of this bond here is going to be attracted to negative ends to other bonds this is an attraction not between each other but between other molecules or other areas on a molecule that also have polar bonds to them we call this type of an attraction an intermolecular attraction inter means between so this is an attraction between molecules it's what holds molecules together it's like water if you spill some water on the table it doesn't just go all over the place it tends to stay together in one spot uh, solids like sugar tends to stick together all together in one clump instead of spreading out and going here and there this is due to intermolecular attractions intermolecular attractions are also responsible for dissolving things now two types of intermolecular attractions that we're going to focus on are the polar intermolecular attractions like this one hydrogen bonding and ions and it's dissolved in water and we're also going to look at nonpolar bonding so let's start out with polar bonding hydrogen bonding that's what we have here is a bonding that we find whenever you have hydrogen that's bonded to one of those three uh, very electronegative elements the nitrogen oxygen or the fluorine so whenever hydrogen is bonded to them as you saw in our last diagram the 
hydrogens become a little bit positive, don't they? So in our water molecule here, we have a little bit positive ends for our hydrogens. And the oxygen has a little bit of a negative end to it. So over here, here is an oxygen. It's a little bit negative. Here's an oxygen. It's a little bit negative. Here's a hydrogen. It's a little bit positive. And between these now, we get ourselves a little bit of an what we call intermolecular attraction where the positive here is attracted to the negative over there. And the positive here is attracted to the negative over there. And the positive here is attracted to the negative over there. These are what we call hydrogen bonding. The bonding between two molecules. Set up because hydrogens in water are a little bit positive and oxygens are a little bit negative. It's not only water that has hydrogen bonding, a lot of other molecules have hydrogen bonding as well. Over here I have a sugar molecule. And on sugar molecules, if you remember from your biology class, there's lots of these little OH groups all over the place on a sugar molecule. All of these OH groups, the hydrogen's a little bit positive, the oxygen's a little bit negative. Hydrogen's a little bit positive, oxygen's a little bit negative. And when you have positive and negative, it can be attracted to other atoms that also have these polar bonds with positive and negative ends on them, like water. Finally, let's take a look at ions that are in water. Here is an ion that's dissolved in water. We can see our positive and our negative ions. And remember that the hydrogens in a water molecule are a little bit positive. So they are attracted to and surround the uh, oxygen there with their positive. I'm sorry, not the oxygen, but the uh, anion over here. So they're attracted to this anion. Likewise, the negative end of the water molecule is a little bit, has a little bit of an attraction for positive cations. Positives, ends of the water molecule attracted to the anion. Negative ends of the molecule attracted to the cation. So the water molecules are able to surround these cations and anions and make it so that they dissolve in water like salt water, where the anions and the cations are broken up, dissociated into the water, and then surrounded by the water molecules, and that's how they dissolve. The other type of bonding here would be nonpolar bonding. It's actually a type of bonding that's known as a London dispersion force, but we're going to just call it nonpolar bonding. Now, nonpolar bonding is set up when you have two atoms that have close to the same electronegativity. So they're pulling on the electrons with about an equal amount of force, similar to our diatomic molecules. Carbon and hydrogen is one example. Carbon and hydrogen have almost an equal amount of electronegativity. So they pull on the electrons equally. They are sharing the electrons equally. It doesn't make a polar bond where one side of it's positive and the other side of it's negative. It's pretty much the same throughout. Neutral. <clears throat> so whenever you see carbons and hydrogens bonded together in what we call hydrocarbons, hydrocarbons is a molecule that's made from carbon and hydrogen, whenever you see those bonded together, you can say, ah, these don't have any positive or negative ends to the bonds. They are what we call nonpolar. Boy, we have a lot of different types of hydrocarbons that are out there. Oils, waxes, plastics, it's all around us, and they all have these very nonpolar bonds. Here's like a 3D picture of the carbons and hydrogens that are attached together. And you can see that in these positive, in, in these uh, 
carbons and hydrogens that are attached together, it's not straight across like the Lewis diagram, is it? It's kind of got this jaggedy movement to it. And so because of that, many times scientists, chemists, will draw out what it looks like with just sticks like this, representing this jaggedy movement here. Each of the little points on this stick is representing a carbon atom and its hydrogens that are attached to it. This happens to be a soap molecule. I think they're pretty cool because the one end of this molecule has a whole bunch of nonpolar carbons and hydrogens attached to each other. And then the other end of the molecule is actually ionic. There's like a sulfate group right there bonded to a, a sodium ion. And so this end of it is nonpolar and likes to hang out with nonpolar things, while this end of the molecule makes it so that it can interact with polar solvents like water. Soap, that's what it does, huh? There's a picture of it right there in more of a 3D format. Another very interesting molecule that we see a lot of that's a hydrocarbon is what we call benzene. Look at this. It's a ring of six carbons, and it has an alternating double and single bond as it goes around. C6H6, benzene, gets used a lot, found an awful lot in nature. Here is the way many scientists will draw it right here. At each of the points, we're assuming that there's a carbon there. And then we don't draw in the hydrogens. There's the alternating double bonds that you can see. So we've seen polar bonds that have unequal poles on electrons. We've seen nonpolar bonding, where they don't have a positive or a negative end. These just kind of mesh together or meld together. They don't have any uh, single attraction to them. So I said the last thing that we need to figure out is to figure out which things dissolve in which things. So that's our question. Will it dissolve? And scientists answer it with a rule of thumb. Like dissolves like. Or what they really mean by that is polar things dissolve in polar things. And nonpolar things dissolve in nonpolar things. When you have a bunch of polar molecules together, they're all attracted to each other with like positives and negatives, like magnets, and it squeezes nonpolar things out. Water we saw was a polar substance, and then oils are nonpolar substance. You know that oils and waters don't mix. That's because polar is stuck together and it squeezes the nonpolar uh, oils right out of it. All right, I hope this helps you out, and I hope you visit again sometime. Good luck with your chemistry.